Today we're going to be looking at another video by Kyle Hill, specifically this one right here called History's Worst Software Error, this one having to do with radiation therapy. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fultz. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry, from engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's get right into it. In 1976, AECL Medical, a division of Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, developed a revolutionary double-pass accelerator, which streamlined linear accelerator designs by using electromagnets to send beams through a target twice instead of once. The Therac-25 was one such double-pass machine, 7 feet high and 12 feet wide, smaller than previous accelerators. Also unlike the accelerators of old, the Therac-25 run principally by software instead of hardware, lines of code instead of interdependent physical mechanisms. That is one way to actually get it to run more precisely without any sort of a physical mechanism. And this is kind of out there, as far, especially for the time period that everything nuclear was to ha require an, an operator. That was one of the ways that Admiral Rickover ended up convincing the powers that be that nuclear submarines would be safe because everything was operated manually. And a lot of that mentality still persists throughout the industry even now. I mean, we're, we've moved away from, from that considerably because this was decades ago. But the idea of introducing software to anything nuclear, whether it be a power plant, um, a submarine, cancer treatment, was a crazy idea <laughs> at the time because everyone was still so um, uncomfortable with, for lack of a better word, with that sort of technology that you just need someone there at any time to be able to turn things off. And there's even, there's even some of that to this day. There's staffing requirements specifically for emergency response that even if like during shift on a nuclear power plant, even if you had zero maintenance going on, uh, middle of the holidays, not planning everything, not moving power at all, you still need a sizable skeleton crew just in case the accident decides to uh, happen at 3 a.m. Christmas morning. People working uh, night shift on Christmas would even make a joke about uh, Santa Claus uh, threatening a nuclear power plant. <laughs> as far as adding software, obviously we use, we use a, a lot of computers now, but I can see how back then there was a lot of uh, fear associated with introducing and hopefully it was thoroughly reviewed the programmers thoroughly checked all their code but i'm not familiar with the therac 25 event but looking at the title of this video something tells me that they could have prepared better 1983 aecl performed a safety analysis on the new machine and started selling the therac 25 to excited customers this state-of-the-art device was in high demand however Left out of that 1983 analysis was any interrogation of the software that ran these complicated devices. Uh, look at this, these old school looking computers. <laughs> Before my time, of course I say that, we've had some old looking orange plasma screens monitoring for critical parameters. Not are the only source of critical parameters, and when I say critical parameters, reactor power, temperature, pressure, they're ancient. But they're, but they're quite hardy and quite accurate, even though they look like you'd be playing Pong or something or something like that. But <laughs> they're also very expensive to replace because people don't make these anymore. Of the code based on the older Therac 20 model and written by a single person. A coding. Ooh, red flag. Nah, all coding now requires at least one peer checker. <laughs> Not just a peer checker, but an independent verifier. So someone that the uh, original writer hands off and then looks at it without any influence by the, uh, the person that wrote the code. And independent verification is taken very seriously in the nuclear industry. The, if an error were found and something were to happen, the independent verifier would be found to be more at fault than the person who originally wrote the code. Hobbyist, 
who left the company in 1986. Hobby. Oh, wow. He remains unidentified to this day. Wow. Two weeks after Katie Yard So we're at two red flags right now. <laughs> Burrow told her technician that she felt a burning sensation during her cancer treatment. There was a red mark the size of a dime on her chest. And directly opposite yeah. that mark, a larger disc on her back. Tim Still, the medical physicist at Kennestone, examined her. That looks like the exit dose made by an electron beam, he said. It looked nothing like what could be created by her prescribed 200 rad dose. The physicist later estimated what 200 reds for electron beam is going to be about the same as 200 rems or two sieverts. So a lot. But this is concentrated to one spot. This isn't whole body dose where two sieverts... If it was a whole body dose, say, from a radiation source, like another example would be during the Leah radiological incident where people found a, an orphan source and just received a lot of dose, then that would be well above the increased risk, uh, risk threshold for cancer and by way above about 20 times that and you would start to uh, experience some of the effects of radiation poisoning. That much to the whole body isn't likely to kill you, but it's still considered a very high dose and needs to be taken very seriously and you would need to receive treatment if it were on the whole body. But this is targeted towards cancer, so it's designed to cause cell death, shrinkage of tumors of the cancer cells specifically. These can be very precise today, but I don't know as much about cancer treatment from 1985. This is a bit ironic, though, that the very thing that can cause cancer, if it's just a gross whole body dose, can be concentrated and used as a weapon to fight cancer. Actually hit Yarborough was closer to 20,000 rats, <laughs> hundreds of times more than what you'd receive standing inside a failed reactor at Fukushima Daiichi. If you were to stand, okay, if you were to stand inside, yeah, um, it'd be up there. This is... This is comparable to if you were to bear hug the elephant's foot at Chernobyl for a little while and right after the accident happened, not, not, not if you were to somehow go in there and do it right now today. So deadly is in rads, is about a thousand for a, for a whole body dose. So this is a lot. But Dr. Still wasn't able to recreate a beam of that strength with the machine himself, so he contacted a professional organization to tell them what had happened. He quickly got a call from the AECL in response, telling him to stop making these claims without any proof. They assured him that such an overdose simply wasn't possible. Mm. Over the next few weeks, the dime-sized red circle on Yarborough's chest became a hole. Skin grafts failed as any new tissue simply rotted away. Her left breast, recently cancer-free, had to be entirely removed. Her left arm was now immobile. This may actually be a little challenging for me to watch. Um, my dad died of cancer when I was 12. He had stage 4 lung cancer when he was first diagnosed. Never smoked. The radiation treatment for the tumor in his lungs burned a hole in his esophagus. No, no errors happened in that treatment. It was just a very concentrated dose that just carried a lot of risk associated with it. But yeah, anything with cancer is horrific. And I'm sure many of you watching this video have lost loved ones to cancer. This is something that you can't afford to make errors in, just like with commercial nuclear power. People make errors, but this is why we have error prevention tools in place, such as, like in I mentioned earlier, in computer programming, for it to be done in pairs, pair programming, and to have an independent verifier. Many sources report it was though a slow motion gunshot wound had gone through her chest and out of her back. Ugh. Yarborough would hire a lawyer and sue the hospital and AECL in the October of 1985. But she wouldn't live to find out the reason why nanoscopic bullets had done this to her. It is a form of targeting. That, that analogy for in, in the concept of beams of energy like that as, as a bullet is an appropriate analogy. I know I... I didn't like it when they mentioned it in the Chernobyl series, but here it's a very 
it's supposed to be a, it's a very targeted precise dose so this analogy makes makes a little bit more sense to me in this in this context seven weeks later concerningly similar to katie yarborough a 40 year old woman with cervical cancer arrived for her most recent therac 25 treatment at the hamilton regional cancer center in ontario canada she too was hit with a slow motion bullet complaining of tingling electric shocks during treatment it would be later estimated that what the therac operator had mistakenly irradiated her hip with several times was a total of 17,000 rads a larger dose than what harry doglian jr or lewis slotten received from the demon corps the aecl was informed immediately and had an engineer dispatched to examine the unit the micro switches that controlled the position of the unit's turntable were deemed faulty and a software change to constantly check the turntable position was introduced aecl would later claim in a september letter to customers that this change had increased the safety of the Therac 25 by five orders of magnitude. Whenever someone mentions increase the safety by this many orders of magnitude, it makes you wonder what the initial design looked like and all the flaws that were found in it. But the cervical cancer patient died a month before this pronouncement, on November 3rd. Her official cause of death was her cervical cancer, though an autopsy revealed that if she had lived, her hip, obliterated by high-energy radiation, would have to have been entirely replaced. Five days later, a letter from the Canadian Radiation Protection Bureau begged AECL for hardware fail-safes and additional software changes, but nothing came of it. Just a month after that That's another. heavily irradiated cervical cancer patient died, it happened again. A Therac 25 unit at the Yakima Valley Memorial Hospital in Washington State supposed to be now 9 million percent safer, hit another cervical cancer patient in the hip with more radiation than what Cecil Kelly endured when a whirlpool of plutonium went prompt critical in his face. I like that he's comparing the dose to the Fukushima disaster and criticality accidents to give a sense of scale. These are all really high numbers, by the way. Every, every dose you've, that has been shown this far in this video is a crazy high dose that you wouldn't expect to receive thankfully the woman ultimately suffered only minor disability and scarring the more impactful outcome was that doctors and therac 25 operators in the u.s and canada were now talking to each other something was going on that the aecl obviously wasn't addressing or didn't care to this is critically important throughout the nuclear industry is to share lessons learned and what to do in response to not not even accidents but just things to uh to make your plants run better but especially with accidents there is within the u.s there is inpo the institute of nuclear power Op operations which it started out after the three mile island accident and its main purpose is to share knowledge to whenever even a, mi a minor incident, a better way of doing things is done at one plant to uh, share it with other plants. And they routinely do site visits and evaluations. The way it's gotten to now is, because Three Mile Island happened way back in 1979, is they're effectively another regulator. Their, their standards are even higher than that of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. There is an international branch to it as well, WANO, a World Association of Nuclear op or Nuclear Operators, and they constantly raise the standards and they uh, talk about striving towards excellence. Even in their office, their headquarters in Atlanta, they have the word excellence written on a stone tablet, but they haven't completed writing the last E on excellence because it's a mindset it's not an end state or a goal you never really get there that's their philosophy now, now make of that what you will but the ultimate purpose of inpo and wano is sharing knowledge and it is you don't see that as much in other industries i've noticed to that same level that you basically have a consultant ngo that more or less acts as a regulator to ensure that knowledge is shared. It's fascinating. And INPO evaluations are probably the most uh, stressful 
portions of any <laughs> any executive in, in in the nuclear industry because they they scrutinize everything and but hey nuclear power is special and unique as the regulators say so these additional controls are put in place to uh help prevent accidents from ever happening again and they look at all the major modifications that were made after the Fukushima event, such as having even further strings of backup systems. The point is, sharing knowledge is something that the nuclear industry does a lot of. And if we did it earlier and things were more open, Three Mile Island might have been it. And we wouldn't have, and we wouldn't have had so many criticality accidents earlier. It would have been the Demon Corps would have stopped that. Two months later, AECL declared that, after careful consideration, we are of the opinion that this damage could not have been produced by a malfunction of the Therac-25 or by any operator error." Mm. End quote. The Therac-25 software likely had around 100,000 lines of code, small by today's standards, but complicated nonetheless, and error-prone. Operators would later testify that they encountered as many as four serious error messages a day. So I didn't code back then because I wasn't alive back then, but I do rem remember in college using Fortran, the same Fortran from 1977, and it's, I'm by no means an expert coder, not, not even a little bit, but it, it was clunky. <laughs> when I was in college around 2010, it was, I mainly worked with, uh, Fortran, C, and MATLAB for like engineering type coding, and Fortran was clunkier and a lot more painful to use than the other two. <laughs> so I believe it when he says coding back then was more error prone. <laughs> Many of those errors would simply read malfunction with a number from 1 to 64. These numbers were not explained, not by AECL, not in any manual. Operators also admitted that they became accustomed to this ambiguity, rather than fearful of it. Another red flag, being accustomed to ambiguity and weird error messages, yeah. They could and did simply press P to proceed, without knowing whether or not an error code was benign or potentially deadly. It was part of the job to keep an expensive and sought-after machine like the Therac running. Malfunction 54. So when errors, um, alarms that um, come in that are, let's, let's just say, n nuisance alarms, compensatory actions are required to address them. And I'm, talk I'm, I'm mainly talking in the context of control room operations. You have an alarm that comes in that you know is faulty, let's, and it's, let's say it's something you can't fix because you're waiting on vendor or parts or something. Well, <laughs> compensatory actions. That would include, uh, that can include temp logs of what the alarm feeds. If you were to disable the alarm function, you could take a temp log, depending on what it is, hourly, shiftly, to make sure the parameters are still in place. That's, that's one example. And for taking a plant computer point off scan, which is basically silence the alarm completely, you're, you're required to do something like that to, in, to ensure your parameters are still well monitored and you don't let that go away. It's also a motivational factor to fix the thing because um, it actually is more work than um, simply letting the alarm uh, go. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It can be a motivational factor, too, to get your stuff fixed. One of these mysterious, undefined errors would turn out to be the one you couldn't skip past. But it would take three catastrophes before anyone figured out what they were allowing to happen. Boyne Ray Cox lay beneath the Therac-25 unit at the East Texas Cancer Center in Tyler, Texas, for his ninth cancer treatment. A technician set his dose at 180 rads. Then she noticed a mistake. She had selected X for X-ray instead of E for electron beam. That's a critical step. Difference between X-rays are lower energy than gamma rays light versus electrons, which is a beam of beta particles, which are heavier and do more things to people's cells. She quickly moved the cursor, made the change, and activated the machine. Malfunction 54. Used to this by now, she hit proceed anyway. Mr. Cox then felt a powerful shock. 
According to reporting done by Barbara Wade Rose, Cox tried to get up, but because the intercom for the room just happened to be broken that day, the technician didn't see him struggling or hear him screaming. Another thing, if that intercom is a critical line of communication, that's, that's another malfunction to add to your list. So she hit him again. Another shock ripped through Mr. Cox. The technician only stopped when she heard Cox slamming the door she was behind with his fists. He was examined by physicians Lord. and sent home, told to return if anything changed. A few weeks later, he returned to the hospital, spitting up blood. After the accident, no one can reproduce Malfunction 54. AECL told the hospital that an overdose was impossible, suggesting maybe it was indeed an electric shock that... And the Titanic was unsinkable, and RBMK reactors do not explode. Don't say impossible. ...reduced the sensations Mr. Cox felt, but ruled that out too. And one thing I want to clarify, I've, I've, I've got some comments. When I've said in other videos about like alpha particles not penetrating the skin, think of it as a big probability spectrum. Logics is it won't, though alpha particles can damage you without penetrating the skin because they can hit your, hit your outer layers. It doesn't necessarily need to penetrate. So thanks again for those people that um, pointed it out to me in, in earlier videos. Those were all very, very good questions, and I appreciate the request for further clarification on that. The company claimed it knew of no other similar accidents, so the use of the Therac unit resumed 17 days later. Voin Ray Cox died the following August after receiving a calculated dose higher oh. than the worst dose a liquidator would receive when the Chernobyl nuclear power plant exploded just a month later. Only four days after the Therac at the East Texas Cancer Center was back online, 66-year-old bus driver Verdon Kidd walked through the lobby on the way to his scheduled treatment. He was to have a Therac-25 aimed at the skin cancer on his face. Ooh. Malfunction 54. Treatment proceeded. A loud noise brought the technician back into the room to find Mr. Kidd writhing in pain, confused. He said it had felt like something hit him on the side of the face. He saw a flash of light, heard an intense, sizzling sound. The Therac-25 yeah. unit at the center was shut down until the cause could be determined. Verdon Kidd died a month later from radiation-induced damage to his brain and brainstem. His death, four months before the death of Voin Ray Cox... Yeah, circles around anything to the face, you know, depending on angles, can get you in the back of the head, the brain, down in the brainstem. Those high-energy beams going straight through. You have to be very careful on, on your settings when this is very precise work. ...was the first recorded fatality from radiation treatment in medical history. The Therac technician on site that day and physicist Dr. Fritz Hager stayed the weekend after the kid accident, attempting to recreate Malfunction 54, the malfunction that AECL said was impossible. They changed the machine's modes, moved the cursor quickly up and down, and typed in different treatment instructions for hours upon hours, and then suddenly, they did it. Dr. Hager telephoned AECL immediately. The FDA, already investigating the accidents, declared the Therac-25 defective. One other thing to point out is the, oh, they, just how they stopped a lot of the questioning if something was brought into question about the safety of a piece of equipment, and yet it was continued to use no, without much in the way of warning signs or saying this is currently under investigation. Not good nuclear safety culture. Demanded a corrective action plan, or CAP, from the company. A letter soon went out from the AECL to all Therac-25 users. Quote, Effective immediately, and until further notice, the key used for moving the cursor back through the prescription sequence must not be used for editing or any other purpose." End quote. It was something that everyone had missed, and it was finally going to be fixed. But even after everyone knew what Malfunction 54 was and how to fix it, the accidents continued. If that key does something, disable it. That's what it is. Disable it if it can't be. <laughs> Reprogram it so that doesn't do anything. Remove the key altogether. If that's your that's your problem, get rid of it. Maybe I'm missing something here because I'm I don't know exactly how the how the coding or the 
software hardware interface works with this this device but that that would be the uh the highest level of safety engineering control would be to just simply remove that problem you don't think of software as something being able to fail once working uh <laughs> software is only as good as the person or ai who wrote that they wouldn't have used ai in the 85 but of course that ai is only as good as the the person or people who programmed it too so yeah software i'm not a software engineer but it can it can fail <laughs> i've i've seen it i've seen it fails spectacularly <laughs> um not with anything nuclear safety related like 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 this like this example but just poorly coded mess design bad gaming experiences yeah Software fails. <laughs> what is in a computer, how could it bend like a steel beam or break like a pane of glass? I get, okay, I get what he's saying now, because it's kind of a black box to most people, I, I would imagine. Kind of like how radiation is, because people don't see it, so they fear it. Huh, I wonder if I've noticed some parallel between people afraid of computers versus radiation, or specifically AI, have, if there's a bit of a fear overlap. But I've also heard the adage, computers don't make mistakes. I think I heard that one. I haven't heard that one since I was a kid. But their mistakes look different than, say, a person making a mistake or a physical failure. I will give them that. But I get what he's saying now. But like any machine, there's a difference between how it's supposed to be used in theory and how it's actually used in practice. Sure. The Therac 25 used mag. Under an accident, a type of accident conditions, you could turn a pressurized water reactor into a boiling water reactor. Just don't want that to happen. That's that ended up happening at Three Mile Island very briefly. It's to filter and control powerful beams of radiation, magnets that, after an input was received, physically took eight seconds to move everything into position. Fine in theory. What Dr. Right. Hager had figured out was that if an operator set radiation levels and then made a change to those levels within the eight seconds it took for the magnets to move, the change was not detected. The magnets were already in motion. Okay, that's a problem. You've hit that point of no return and then you ch yeah, okay. Can't turn on a dime, basically. This could and did allow powerful, unfiltered beams of radiation to strike patients. This animation, reproduced in Spanish, shows the sequence of events needed to produce Malfunction 54. In theory, an operator would make a change and then wait for the magnets in the machine to move. But an experienced operator, working with the Therac every single day, encountering multiple error messages a shift, is in practice more than likely of making a change, like changing a beam from X-ray to electron, within 8 seconds. There was no code in place to check whether the prescribed input on the monitor matched what the machine was actually set up to wow, do. Wow, and these guys had no the idea. The Therac 25's reliance on software and not hardware interlocks like previous models also meant that input errors didn't have mechanical failsafes that wouldn't listen to the mistakes that ended up fatally irradiating. And that brings us back to the Admiral Rickover argument that mechanical failsafe for, ev for everything. That's why SCRAM for a reactor trip or an emergency shutdown stood for Safety Control Rod Axeman. It wasn't a physical, it wasn't an actual dude at the top of the reactor with an axe, but it was basically the equivalent of rods delatch and fall in. So it was kind of like hitting an axe, but it's more of a loss of power. You lose the, the holding, the holding coils cease to hold anymore, they fall in. So basically you cut them and it's great it's gravity and cutting them is cutting the power with malfunction 54 finally identified aecl sent the first corrective action plan to the fda part of which were changes to the therac software to the machine where the cursor actually was the cap was revised twice by the fda over the next few months and therac 25s were back in use before the end of the year six weeks later a Therac unit killed again. On January 17, 1987, Glenn Dodd, 65, walked into the Yakima Valley Memorial Hospital. An accident continuing to happen for years. Crazy. For treatment of a carcinoma. 
his disease was to be flooded with 86 rats. The Therak instead bombarded the man's chest with 10,000. He died from acute radiation poisoning three months later. That'll do it. Inside the code was a so-called housekeeper task that would constantly check whether or not the machine's turntable was in the correct position, make adjustments if necessary, and then revert to zero. Anything other than a zero in the code, therefore, was an error, and the machine would not proceed with treatment. Again, good in theory. However, like your car's odometer, this code ticked up checks only until a certain value, in this case, one byte of memory, 256. After that, it would tick over to zero out of necessity. If it reminds me of the, uh, this is a tragic real life version of the Gandhi overflow error from the civilization games, where Gandhi would start off peace loving and would research some technology that would lower his belligerence rating, but his drops below zero and maxes it out. So it turns Gandhi from peace loving to some crazy guy who wants to nuke everyone on the face of the planet and crush their remains with a bunch of giant death robots. After months of revisions, AECL told customers that the FDA had accepted a final corrective action plan. It included 23 software changes and six hardware safety features, the largest of which was a dose per pulse monitor affixed to the machine that would shut down dangerous doses even if all the software safety checks failed. Today, the Therac 25 is more a staple of ethics and computer science class required readings than it is of medicine, a unique case study of what can go wrong when new technology is trusted implicitly and when ethical decision making malfunctions. Any type of new software entering into a nuclear plant. So after, you know, you're, you write code. So after the, uh, the pair programming, peer checking, independent reviews, after all that, anything introduced to a nuclear plant would go through a rigorous software quality assurance program. And that is when it is thoroughly vetted by a whole bunch of software, computer experts, uh, cybersecurity experts, just to make sure that they thought of everything and this is and this isn't just an onboarding thing this is something that is periodically reviewed throughout the life cycle of this new software product that is introduced even things like the new microsoft office suite package is thoroughly reviewed because you're going to use nuclear ac applications associated with them aecl assumed that the software for the therac 25 written by a single unidentified hobbyist and imported from the older Therac 20 model, did not have residual so software errors to be tested. It didn't consider how the machine was being used in practice, never envisioning something like Malfunction 54. The company repeatedly denied knowing of any accidents and believed that overdoses were impossible. It made proclamations like five orders of magnitude increases in safety that were physically impossible. That makes you wonder, five, so something that is impossible to happen, well now it's, now it's, what, five orders, five orders of magnitude, you know, this, <laughs> 10,000 times less likely to happen. It's like, well, how does that work? <laughs> Documentation on all software for new medical products, which the Therac 25 didn't have, that can be investigated independently. Ten years after the deadliest software errors in history, reporter Barbara Wade Rose asked Bill Byrd, the lawyer for the first Therac victim, Katie Yarborough, to comment on the events. Quote, The thing that amazes me is that the people who develop these machines are surely some of the most brilliant people in the world. This machine was unbelievably sophisticated. And yet... Gotta go through checks, and there's a lot of brilliance out there. It just needed to go through its required checking and quality assurance processes, then they probably would have found it. Nobody would have gotten hurt if somebody had just used common sense. Thanks again for the recommendation for this video. Another well-researched Kyle Hill video around yet another predictable nuclear accident. This one wasn't really shared heavily with me and my industry peers. I mean, I guess it's a little different because it involves radiation therapy as opposed to nuclear power operations. I'm sure some of my colleagues in like in cybersecurity or anything with software 
probably got a lot more of this, but it's really just anything involving new technology, engineering design changes. Um, it's applicable to a lot more than just software engineers, I think. I think we could have could have used uh, a review of something like this because it could be, you know, for a physical design change as well. The point is, that's why we have QA processes. That's why we have peer checkers. That's why we have independent verification. And we take all those things very seriously. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.